Good evening, church. It's good to have you with us tonight. Those of you from Charleston First Church, those of you at Elk River, we're glad that you're with us tonight. We're here to praise the Lord. We're here to lift him up tonight. Though we're small in number, that rain has kept a lot of people in. But you know what? We got a Sunday school class going on downstairs. And we have a ministry group over at Charleston First Church this evening that is going to be feeding the West Side Gathering group that meets there. So God is working. God is using us. And aren't you glad that a little bit of rain is not going to stop us? There's some good old songs in the hymnal that we don't sing very often. But we're going to sing some of them tonight. And the first one being, To God Be the Glory. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he has done great things he has taught us great things he has done and great our rejoicing through jesus the son but purer and higher and greater will be our wonder our transport when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory great things he has done aren't you glad tonight for all the great things that god has done more than we'll ever begin to remember more than we'll ever be able to thank him for what a great god we serve we're going to sing another old one that says all hail the power of jesus name let angels prostrate fall bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Oh, hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem. and seed of Israel's race ye ransom from the fall hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord of all hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him on this terrestrial ball to him all majesty ascribe and crown him lord of all to him all majesty ascribe 
and crown him Lord of all. Oh, that with yonder sacred throne we at his feet may fall. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. Aren't you grateful for that? We're going to crown him Lord of all. I remember a song my mom used to sing when I was growing up. And it simply says, and it's got some great words to it, but it said something like this. They'll never crown my Jesus until I get home. And aren't you glad when we get home, they're going to crown him Lord of Lords, King of Kings. What a great time. And guess what? We get to be there for it. We all get to be there for it. What a wonderful time that's going to be. It's another old hymn of the church. We don't sing it a whole lot. I think we ought to sing it a lot more. But it simply says, How firm a foundation. How firm a foundation. Ye saints of the Lord is laid for your faith. In his excellent word, what more can he say than to you he has said to you who for refuge to Jesus have fled? Fear not. I am with thee, oh, be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will still give thee aid, I'll strengthen thee, help thee, and cause thee to stand upheld. By my righteous, omnipotent hand. When through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee, I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. The soul that on Jesus hath leaned for repose I will not, I will not desert to his foes. That so, though all hell shall endeavor to shake, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. Aren't you glad for that? That he's never going to forsake us. I like that song. It says, though, uh, though all hell should endeavor to shake us, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake you. And aren't you glad? I mean, it doesn't matter how bad Satan tries to shake us and, and get us messed up and... I mean, just does everything he can against us. But aren't you glad for that firm foundation in Jesus Christ? He'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. Aren't you grateful tonight for a wonderful Lord? Sing with us. 
My wonderful Lord, my wonderful Lord, by angels and seraphs in heaven adored, I bow at thy shrine, my Savior divine, my wonderful one. Wonderful Lord, my wonderful Lord, my wonderful Lord, my angels and seraphs in heaven adored, I bow at thy shrine, my Savior divine. My wonderful, wonderful Lord. I'm going to ask Susan to just keep playing that tonight. Isn't it good to know that we have a wonderful Lord that loves us and cares about us? You know, we're a needy people. We have a lot of needs, a lot of things that we need to pray about. And it just seems like that list gets longer and longer all the time but you know what he's never too busy to listen I like what I think it was Craig said last Sunday morning about when we're going through our kids are going through tough times there's nothing like when they come and crawl up on dad's lap they feel dad's breath on their face and on their head and every once in a while, I think we need to do that. We need to go crawl up on Daddy God's lap and say, Father God, or as the little trans literal translation says, Daddy God, I just need you to breathe on me. I just need to know that you've got hold of me and that I am in your care. And that you've got everything under control. There's some people that are depending upon us tonight. We need to continue to pray for the Jarvis family. David lost his mom the other day. Pray for that family that God would just intercede and work in a very special way. Barbara Stutler's friend, Mary Keffer, is in Cleveland Clinic. Let's pray for her. We got good report from Patty going to Cleveland Clinic this past week. And we just praise the Lord for that. Gwen was sitting back there with Jeff Legg this morning and said that Jeff told her, he said that he got a good report from his doctors the last time he was there, just this, I think it was this past week. God is working. God is working. And we're grateful for that. There's some others we need to remember, though. I've got a couple special requests I'd like you to remember tonight. I want you to pray for Jaden tonight. Jaden lets some. Jaden's sick at home. You know, Jaden's here in church. Maybe it has something to do with Poppy being a preacher and him having to be here. But I, I would also like to think that Jaden likes coming to church. And so let's just pray for him. He's not feeling well and... They had to take him to the doctor the other day, and they've got him on some medication, so pray for Jaden. I got a friend that retired the other day from work. David is 10 days older than I am, or 10 days younger than I am, I'm sorry. He started at my job about three months after I did. So I've known David for roughly 30 years. And I had one of our friends come into the office the other day and she was telling me, she said, David's retiring. She said about two weeks ago, she said he had to have all the toes amputated on his right foot. Said a year or so ago, he had to have toe on the other foot removed. David's got a lot of health issues. And I'd just like you to remember my friend David. Not a good way to head into retirement. But I just pray that somehow, some way, that maybe God would speak to him. David's been to our church here before. David's been in my home and I've been in his. 
I just want you to remember my friend David. You know, working in the tax office during tax season can be quite interesting. You meet all kinds of people. But I met a family several years ago. And I heard their story. I heard about Larry. Larry was a double lung transplant patient. Larry's up in years. He and his wife have come to me for years. Their grandson, I'm the only one that's ever done his taxes. But I got a call from Regina yesterday, and she told me, she said, Larry's in the hospital. She said he's not responding. Said they've had him on a respirator for eight days now. They said he is in kidney failure. Things just don't sound too good. But I'm grateful for a God that is able to reach down and touch. And I just ask that you all would remember my friend Larry tonight, laying there in that hospital, that God would just go to him and be everything that he needs him to be. That he would just go and put his arms around him and whether he heals him or whether he takes him home, would you just pray for Larry tonight and for Regina, his wife? Let's go to the Lord in prayer this evening. Father, we thank you tonight for all that you mean to us. We're grateful tonight, Father, that you are a wonderful Lord. We're glad tonight, Father, that even in the deepest, darkest trials of our life, that you are there. You do not leave us, you do not forsake us. And Father, we think of those families that have recently lost loved ones. We think of the Jarvis family. Father, as they laid that mother, that grandmother, that friend to rest just the other day. Father, go and wrap your arms of love around them tonight. And may they feel your peace in your presence in a special way. Father, we think tonight of Sonny. And Father, we prayed and we prayed that you would touch him and you saw fit, Father, instead to take him home. Father, be with that family. Be with Tim and Autumn. Be with all of them, Lord. Be with his wife. Father, just be all they need you to be. For Patty's family. For the Keys family. And so many others that have lost loved ones recently. Just draw up close to them. And Father, we think tonight of Barbara's friend in Cleveland Clinic. And just ask that you would go there. And that you would draw her up close. Father, we think of Jaden tonight at home and not feeling well. And I just pray, Lord, that in a special way that your healing touch would be upon him. Father, I pray tonight for my friend David and my friend Larry. Father, we don't understand how you work and why you choose to work in ways that you do. But Father, we lift these gentlemen up to you tonight knowing that we can have confidence that you're in charge, that you're still God, and you know what you're doing. We may not understand it. The families may not understand what you're doing and why you're choosing to work in the way that you are in their lives and in their families. But Father, speak to them, we pray. Father, most importantly, speak to them about their souls. Father, if they don't know you, might you speak, speak, speak sweet peace to them even right now. Father, go to them. Father, we've come tonight to worship you, to lift you up. We look all around us. We've seen rain all day and 
Father, it's been kind of gloomy and dreary outside. But we're thankful tonight to be in your sanctuary, in your house. And we would just pray that the sweet peace and presence of God would come into this place. And Father, that you would work amongst us. Draw us up closer to you. Use your servant Colton tonight as he shares with us from your word. Might the words that he shares not be his words, but might they be yours. Use your servant, we pray. Bless us tonight. Bless him at First Church. Bless him in Sunday school tonight. All that's going on, get praise, honor, and glory for it all. In Jesus' name we pray and we ask it all. Amen. Let's sing this again one more time. Yes. Sure. Sure, Susan wants to say something first. Um, Hold on, Susan. You've got to have this because they've got to hear you online. Um, just ask prayer for my two, my middle daughter and my youngest daughter. Whitley has had thyroid cancer and had her thyroid removed, and now there's a mass. And uh, they're sending her to the dentist tomorrow to make sure it's nothing here. And then she's going to a, her surgeon that did the the thyroidectomy. And Erin found out this week, this all happened on Wednesday, uh, she found out this week that the injections she was getting for her pain, they said there's nothing else they can do and they might, they said the only thing they know is to send her to Cleveland Clinic. So our, and then Jaden got sick. So our family's been really hit hard this week. So I just ask for prayer for my family. Um, one of your babies, all three of them are my babies, and I, I just, I know God's able, and I just leave it in his hands. Mike, I'll get to you. You don't, okay. i tell you what we're going to do, Susan, before you leave, because Susan's got to go home to Jaden. But I'm going to ask Susan to come right down here. You see, my Bible tells me, is there any sick? You call the elders of the church and you ask them to lay hands on them and pray. And tonight we're just going to come. I want as many of you that will that are here to just kind of gather. I know we're not supposed to do this kind of stuff. Put your mask on. If you ha you're fine, Susan, stay there. If you don't feel comfortable doing it, just kind of reach that direction as if you're reaching out to Susan and the Ledson family tonight. And let's just pray and ask God to be with Whitley and Aaron and just ask that God would do something special, that God's peace, presence, and power would work in their lives. You know, I know there's physical needs, but you know what? They also just need to draw up close to God. And I would just ask that you all would remember them in a very special way. Father, tonight, we lift to you our Parsonage family. Father, tonight, we lift to you Randy and Susan Ledsom. We love and appreciate the servants that you have sent to us. And Father, we believe they're here tonight not because they want to be but because you've called them here you have sent them to us for a purpose and for a reason and father tonight we just lift them up to you because satan's worked in that home this week and he's tried to destroy and defeat and discourage but we're glad tonight that you're still going to win for the Bible teaches us that we are winners when we're on your side. And so tonight I pray, Lord, that you'd be with Pastor Randy as he's at Charleston First Church. Father, that you would be with Susan as she's here with us. That you would go to Jaden up there at the house, Lord, as he's not feeling well. Father, that you would go to Whitley tonight, that you would touch her, Lord, touch the, the throat, Lord, whatever the issue is, just work in a special way. Father, for Aaron tonight, Father, I just pray that you would lift her up. 
Father, I think tonight of Emily and Jason and the rest of the family, Lord. We just lift up our Parsonage family and their extended family. And we just pray that in a very special way tonight that they would know that they are loved and that they are cared about and that more than our love, there's a God in heaven that loves them and cares about them. And he knows what they're going through. And he's promised he'd never leave them, that he'd never forsake them, that he'd never leave them alone. And Father, in the midst of all that they're going through, Father, let them be able to stand and praise you and give you glory and give you honor. We believe you're going to work. We know you've already begun to work, and we're going to trust you that you will continue to work in their family and for all that you're going to do through them and for them. We're going to thank you and praise you in Jesus' holy name. Amen and amen. Aren't you glad tonight for God's peace? Can I just encourage you this week? If you get a chance, let our Parsonage family know you love them. Yeah, Danny. Dewey and Janet Tanner, friends of Danny's, and just ask that God would used to sing together. Just pray that God would be with them. I know we've already done a lot of stuff here, and Colton's finally showed up. Hey, buddy, it's good to see you. But before he comes, you know what? I'm going to ask Mike if he'd do me a favor. Mike, would you step this way? Right up front's fine. I just want you to, yeah, Mike, you're the only Mike in the house, buddy. I want you to stand right here, and I want you to pray for the Tanners. And just ask that God would be with them. And then I want you to pray for Colton as he gets ready to come and share with us tonight. And we're going to just trust God for whatever he has for us this evening. Father, we, we praise you first. And God, we give you glory. And we'll give you honor. Lord, we lift up your name. And God, we believe we're here for a purpose. And that purpose is to serve you and praise you. God, our Bible guides us that, that when we have a need, when we have a burden, that we're, we're to lay it at your feet and come in faith believing. And God, now just for these tanners, Lord, we just ask for a holy anointing. God, for a special touch. God, we, we hate this COVID. We hate the fact that Satan put it here. So God, just now proclaiming, get behind me, Satan, with this disease. Lord, just, God, we just ask for your, your holy healing hand upon them as they, as they go day by day. So God, we pray that we won't forget about this request when we leave here this evening. And God, for Colton, Lord, we've come to, to love this young man, Lord. We just want to lift him up. God, we ask for your, for your power, for your divine presence, Lord. Just put, put the words on his tongue, Lord, and let it burn our ears and our heart and mind that we might be better able to go and serve you. So God, just, just for the next bit especially, Lord, just reach down and touch him in a mighty way. In Jesus' name, amen. Don't forget the rest of the activities this week around the church. God's got special things in store for Elk River and Charleston First Church. Brother Colton, come. Share with us tonight what God has. All right. All right. Good evening. <laughs> Hello. I hope you guys are doing well. I apologize for my lateness there. I plum forgot that I was supposed to be here. <laughs> I hope you'll forgive me. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, I'm so glad to be with you guys again, and I'm uh, I'm happy to to be out and not sitting in my house. Just. Uh, feeling like I'm taking up space. Uh, so uh, we'll just jump right in and uh, 
and uh, we'll get started. So uh, tonight my sermon is on uh, um, how do we know Jesus. It's how to witness to um, somebody that isn't a Christian or doesn't even know about God or anything like that. Um, but first I want to I break, uh, break the ice a little bit and you know, start out with a little joke. A new pastor was uh, looking to become ordained and he stood before the elders and the district superintendent and said, uh, they said, the district superintendent said, well, Sam, will you tell, tell me the parable of the Good Samaritan? Yes, sir, I will, sir, gladly, sir, I will, sir, he says. He says, I, once there was this man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among the thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked him. And as he went on his way, he didn't have no money. And there, were, there he met Queen of Sheba, and she, and she gave him a thousand talents and a hundred changes of raiment. And he got into a chariot and drove furiously, and when he was driving under a big juniper tree, his hair got caught in a limb of that tree, and he hung there many days. And the ravens brought him food to eat and water to drink, and he ate 5,000 loaves of bread and two fishes. So, One night, when he was hanging there asleep, his wife Delilah came along and cut off his hair. And he dropped and fell on stony ground. But he got up and went on. And it began to rain. And it rained and rained forty days and forty nights. And he, he hid himself in a cave and he lived on locusts and, and honey. Wild honey, I'm sorry. <laughs> and then he went on and, uh, until he met a servant who said, Come take supper at my house. And he made, excu made excuses and said, No, I won't. I have married a wife and can't go. And, and the servant went on into the highways and into the hedges and compelled him to come in. <laughs> After supper, he went on and, and came down there to Jericho. And when he got there, he looked up and saw that, that old queen Jezebel sitting down way up high in the window. And she laughed at him. And he said, Throw her down out there. And they threw her down out there. And he, and he said, throw her down again. And they threw her down 70 times 7. <laughs> and the fragments that remained, they, they picked up 12 basketfuls besides women children, and, and children. And they said, blessed are the peacemakers. Peace, P-I-E-C-E. -E. Now, now whose wife do you think she will be on the day of judgment? That guy was a little messed up, wasn't he? <laughs> it sounds like he had most of the, uh, the stories of the Bible just, you know, compiled into one story, and, and he, 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 he messed it up. I'd love to tell that story. It's a, I'd love to memorize it one day so I could just read it off or, or uh, just, you know, mutter it off. I, but like I said, I think he got the gist of all the stories, but just kind of lost the context, right? It's important to have context. Talk about a, a game of telephone, right? <laughs> so a few nights ago, uh, I, I had an opportunity to, uh, to begin a dialogue with a friend of mine that, uh, that I know is not a Christian. Uh, he lost his faith a long time ago. Um, I don't really know why. I think he mentioned that he hasn't been the same since he watched a film uh, about, you know, Zotgeist, I don't know what it was, I can't remember the film, but uh, he, he said he, that pretty much turned him away from all religion. And he claims that he's agnostic now, and, he's, and he doesn't know if any human can fully comprehend God and who God is. He said no one can ever comprehend who God fully is. And that's true. Nobody can know who God fully is, right? He has mystery to him, right? But let me share with you a few things that Jesus says. It says in Matthew seven twenty one through uh, 23, he says, uh, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the ones who... who the only the one who does my, the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, 
did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, evildoers. I like to believe that we're all rational thinkers here. If Jesus says, I never knew you, would that imply that you could know him? How many can figure that out without any help? You could know Jesus, right? You could know him by the, the somebody could have known him back then, right? He had friends. Obviously, we have the Gospels. If the Lord says, get away from me, I never knew you, does that mean that there were people that knew him? That there are people that know him? Does that mean that he can be known? That's my question. <clears throat> this gentleman sitting next to me at the time was, uh, he either never read that verse, never gave much thought to that verse because he told me that he read the Bible, he went to Catholic school growing up, or he forgot this verse, or he doesn't care about this verse. Now, I don't want to say that this is infallible proof that you can know God, but it's a pretty good one. <laughs> but this week, this, uh, a couple weeks ago, I actually uh, lost a new friend. I had just you know, met this guy, and, and we were building a, a friendship, building a relationship, and I had seen him the day before he committed suicide. <clears throat> I found out that he committed suicide a few days later. Somebody had messaged me and said, hey, did you hear about fish? And, and uh, I, when I, when I got that message, the thing that kept, kept coming back, kept replaying in my mind was, why didn't, you, why didn't you talk about Jesus with him? Why didn't you do what you usually do and ask him what he believed? Why didn't you, you know, I, I've seen you several times, you know, <laughs> I've seen you in a hot tub talking to Muslims about what they believe, questioning, prodding. I've seen... I'm talking to myself here. You know, I've, I've seen you talk to atheists right off whenever you're working as a waiter talking about Jesus. Why didn't you do this with your new friend that you say? The question that keeps popping in my head is, could I have planted a seed? I couldn't have stopped him. Definitely not. If it was in his mind, if, it was, if he was driven... If it was already there, then there's nothing that I could have done. But the question does arise, could I have planted a seed? Could I have said, you know, God loves you. Genesis, it says we created God in our own image. or We, we created man in our own Im image. I, I apologize. That means you have intrinsic value. It means you have, that you are a valuable person, that you have something worth something to God. Could I have maybe prolonged this? Maybe prevented it? Or was I too late? In my short time here on earth, I, my 31 years, I've had several friends pass away from one thing or another. Now, I, I assume everybody in, in this room is a little older than me, just a little bit, just a little bit. And I would assume that you have lost even more. <clears throat> But this is, to me, this is, this is something new. This is something that is really, 
really stuck with me for the past couple weeks. Something that uh, has, in a sense, haunted me, if you will. I could stand here and, and I could tell you that, uh, you know, it was because I, I, needed, I needed to walk on eggshells because we were brand new friends. I didn't want to offend him. You know, because of the, cli- the, the political climate that we're in right now, I, di- I didn't want to push. I could tell you that it's because I, you know, I didn't want to offend him. I wanted to build that relationship before I talked to him about religion. I could, I could say that. I could give you excuse after excuse as to why I didn't. I can justify myself. But the truth is, I don't have an excuse. I'm living with this guilt of not sharing the gospel with someone that clearly needed it. But I was too blind to see. But that taught me an extremely, extremely valuable lesson. I will never miss another opportunity to talk to another person about Jesus. I will never miss another opportunity to spread the good news. That's what the gospel means, good news. It's Greek for good news, right? I will never miss that opportunity again. But how do you tell someone about God? Where do you, where do you begin? How do you enter into that conversation with someone that you just met? Why shouldn't I wait until we get, get a little better and acquainted? Today, I, I, I want to open up our, our Bibles to uh, Acts 17. I'm actually uh, in a class right now through the... Uh, through the school of ministry where we're talking about uh, Christianity in a pluralistic, you know, explaining Christianity in a pluralistic uh, world. Pluralistic means that there's more than one God. There's more, there are people that believe in more than one thing. There's more truth out there. That's not your truth, that's my truth, right? But what is truth? Is truth all-inclusive? Tell that to my math teacher (laughs) or my history teacher. Truth is not all-inclusive, folks. I'll give you that. Uh, I'm I'm pretty sure a uh, freshman law student would beg to differ. (laughs) So, but today I want to look at uh, chapter 17 in Acts, and I want to have a discussion about it. Now, in the first part of Acts here, it's, uh, it's Paul. It's Paul talking about how he's, he's witnessing to the Jews, right? And then we, we, have a, we go on. So let's, let's start here. Now, when they had, just for, just for your knowledge, before I start, I'm sorry. I can't pronounce these names very well. So I'm going to brush over them. I might call them geological locations or <laughs> or something like that. That place or, you know, I'm going to, it's going to be unceremonial. So uh, just so you know. <laughs> now, now when they, they had passed through uh, that place and Apollonia, they, they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of Jews. When Paul, as his custom was, Went into them and for three Sabbath reasoned or for three Sabbaths reasoned with, uh, with them from the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead, and saying, "This Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ." And some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks. And not a few of the leader, uh, leading women joined Paul and Silas. But the Jews, who were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gatherings, and gathering a mob, set 
all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them back, er, bring them out to the people. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, These who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Jason has harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying, There is an, another king, Jesus. And they troubled the, the crowd and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. So when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. Now let me stop right there for a second. You see, the, like I said, the first part of this is, is Paul defending Jesus through the Scriptures. I would assume that he probably pointed out Isaiah 53. That's what I would do if I was preaching to my Jewish friends. I'd be like, what do you do with this verse? <laughs> this sounds exactly like Jesus. If you go back and you look into Isaiah 53, the whole entire chapter sounds exactly like Jesus. And not a single rabbi would dispute that. They'll say that's, that's what it sounds, but we, we don't believe in Jesus, right? So, I want to skip here. <clears throat> and I want to go down to uh, verse 16, where, where Paul gets to Athens. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Therefore, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him and some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Erpegus, like I said, I, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not sure on that one, saying, may we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean for all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. So what they're saying here is, uh, before I go on, what they're saying is the Stoic uh, philosophers, these guys that like to sit around and talk about things all day, uh, Sounds like our politicians, but <clears throat> these these guys they want to uh, they want to know what Paul is talking about, right? So he brings them he brings them to uh, or they bring the, him to this big council basically, and uh, they want him to tell the whole story. So they start from the beginning. What are you preaching? What you, what new idea do you have for us? Let's go on. He says, Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious, for as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. Therefore, the one who, whom you worship without knowing, I, him I proclaim to you. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with, with men's hands as though he needed anything since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. <coughs> Excuse me. And he, he made uh, from one blood every nation of men and dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times 
and the boundaries of their dwellings, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him. Though he is not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. As also some of your own poets have said, for we, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by, by art and man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Now let me stop right there before, before I finish up. Let me go back <clears throat> to the unknown God. To the unknown God. You see, back then, the Romans and the Greeks, they worshipped their own gods. They had several, you know, Zeus, Jupiter, all these different gods, uh, Hades, um, Mars, all these, all these different gods that you can uh, look up into or look into if you like mythology. I personally love mythology. I think it's very interesting. Um, but, <clears throat> but they, they they had a statue to every single god that that was worshipped. Small statues, big statues. The bigger the god, the bigger the statue. The more following the god had. Zeus had a huge following, so he had a big statue. Athena had a huge following, so she had a big statue. She had a whole city named after her. <laughs> so, uh, and, and they're in it, Athens, right? <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> so the bigger the god, the bigger the statue. They even have a, a statue to the unknown god. See, these, what Paul was getting at whenever he was saying uh, what he was saying earlier, he was saying, I, I realize that you guys are religious people. You guys are, you, you guys enjoy religion. You even, you, you covered your whole bases. You don't know which God is, is the right God. You even have one to the unknown God. But I'm here telling you that the unknown God is the God of all these gods. Is the, he, he's the God that, that created you people that created these gods, right? That's what he was saying. He was saying, and, and then he goes back he starts from the beginning. He said, God created. He, in the beginning, God created. And I'm sure he went through this whole thing. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure how Luke probably, probably wrote this, but he, I would assume that he probably paraphrased a lot. I would assume he probably wasn't dictating there in, in the thing, but Paul was like, listen, this is what I said. And Luke took it down. I'm not saying that I know that, but that's, that's my theory. You, you, you don't have to believe that. That's fine. I would assume that Paul took it all the way back to the beginning. He started with Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Or maybe he started with John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. So how do you start a conversation with a non-believer? Sometimes you have to start with the beginning. I have a lot of atheist friends that want to debate evolution. That's what they that's what they that's what they die on. That's the hill that they choose to to die on. That's the that's the th that's the crux in their in their faith. Did you know 75% of uh, students that attend college one year lose their faith? 75% That's a lot. And we wonder why our churches are empty. I'm not saying it's the church's fault. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is there's a, there's a doctrine out there. There's a religion out there called evolution. And it's been soaked in to our school systems. I'll tell you what. <clears throat> I'm going to try to brainwash you guys right now. 
And I, I want to show you how easy it is to brainwash you. A gentleman leaves home, and he jogs, he jogs a little bit, and he turns left. He jogs a little bit more, and he turns left. He jogs a little bit more, and he turns left. And he sees two masked men standing at home. Who are the two masked men? How many can figure that out? No? I'll give it to you one more time. Huh? He's back home. He's back home, yeah. So a man leaves home. I'll give it to you one more time. A man leaves home, and he jogs a little bit, and he turns left. He jogs a little bit, and he turns left. He jogs a little bit, and he turns left, and he heads back home. And at, at home, there are two masked men. Who are the two masked men, and why did he leave home? He's playing baseball. Left home, turn left, turn left. He hit a home run. Two masked men were the umpire. You see, it's so easy to, you're, you guys are thinking, I said home, you guys are thinking a house, right? It's so easy to brainwash, and I'm going to tell you how, how they brainwash our children. I, I guarantee you, you can go to the library right now, at your school, at your local schools, and you can pull out a, a book about dinosaurs. And it's going to say, millions of years ago, they were dinosaurs. Now, I'm not saying that the world is not millions of years old. Or I, I personally believe that in a, in a young earth, I believe the Bible is true. I believe that uh, you know, we live on a 6,000-year-old planet. And you can, you can do all the, all the math and stuff. We can talk about gap theory. We can talk about all that stuff. If you want to, you catch me afterwards. We'll talk about that. Love it. Love it creation and evolution love to talk about that i could do it all night but i won't <laughs> uh, my wife would not be happy um <laughs> but when you talk about this when with somebody new it's nice to talk about evolution it's nice to talk about all this stuff but remember paul goes on to say and let's finish this right here he goes on to say, he says, And then they heard of, this re of the resurrection of the dead. Some mocked, while others said, We will hear you again on this matter. So Paul departed from, the, from among them. However, some men joined him and believed. Among them, Dionysus and that person, a woman named Demarius, and others with them. <clears throat> So Paul gets to the resurrection. He skims over evolution. He's, he skims over the creation. I'm sorry, not evolution. He skims over the creation. He says, God created the heavens and the earth. God created this earth that you're standing on. He's in charge. You better learn who he is. And I'm telling you right now that he is Jesus in flesh. And the reason I know that is because he died and was resurrected. The reason I believe, personally, not, I'm not Paul, the reason I believe, personally, is the evidence for Jesus Christ, the historical Jesus Christ, is insurmountable. You can look into it. You can ask me about it. I'll, I'll, I'll have a discussion with you again all day. The historical figure of Jesus Christ is true. And if Jesus is true, if Jesus did die and was resurrected then what he says has value. That's the only reason that I follow Jesus. Because he died and was resurrected. He said some great things. If he didn't die and resurrect, I'd, I'd still read his readings or his, his, uh, his teachings. They were great teachings. But if he didn't die and he, he wasn't resurrected and he wasn't seen by 500 people and his disciples and Thomas didn't put his, his hand up into his rib cage and into his, his hands, I would have said, this guy's a ghost. <laughs> These guys are just seeing ghosts. No, he put his hand inside of his, other, his palm or his, uh, his wherever his, he, he was pierced. I would assume it was probably... Right here, that's usually where they do it, not on the palm. But he put his hand in his rib cage. 
The evidence is, is, is insurmountable. I could go on. So what Paul does is he, he talks, he skims over creation, and then he goes straight to the resurrection. He said, I'll talk to you about, this, and this is what I tell my atheist friends, I'll talk to you about evolution all day, but I want you to know Jesus Christ wants to know you, and he wants to be your friend. He wants to be in a relationship with you. That's what he craves, and that's what he wants. He does not want you, and I do not want you to go to hell. I do not want you to sit on this earth and think that, that you're, you're the worst person in the world. I don't, I don't know what you did in your past. You, you might be the worst person in the world. But I want to tell you right now that you have intrinsic value. That God loves you. Even though the world hates you right now. I've, I've been hated by the world. I've been called all kinds of names. It's fine. I don't care. I really don't care what people think. I'm worried about God. I'm worried about what He thinks. Right? It says that uh, you know, some, people, some people wanted to kill Him. Some people hated Him. Some people hated Paul for this message. Uh, Jews hated Him so much that they grabbed a mob together to try to murder Him. I'm not there yet. Maybe one day. <laughs> But, you know, but it also says that some people heard this. And I'm not saying that all, all the atheists that I've ever talked to, I, I guarantee none of the atheists that I've ever talked to have ever turned away from their atheism. I'm not here to convince people. I'm here to show people evidence. And they can take that evidence however they want. I'm here to present the truth. And they can do with it what they want. And that's what Paul is, Paul is getting at. I, I, I'm going to give you the evidence that I have. I was a law student. I, I studied the law. I studied the Torah. I, I was top of my class. I'm, I sell tents for, for, for uh, you know, money on the side. But every week I am here in synagogue and I am telling you that Jesus Christ is real. That Jesus Christ was the Messiah. That Jesus Christ was the person that you, you Jews put to, put to death and that he's my savior and he wants to be your savior too even though you put him to death repent and follow him I'll never miss another opportunity because of that gentleman and that might be the silver lining in his in his suicide but at the same time I wish it would have never happened I wish I would have not been blind. And I know that you know some people that you missed an opportunity with as well. I know we all have that. We all have that guilt in our hearts. I dated a girl before my wife. Yeah, it happened. <laughs> don't tell her. I don't want to sleep on the couch tonight. <clears throat> I dated a girl and uh, she she got in a car with some drunk people we, were, we weren't dating anymore but I had talked to her maybe a week before See if she, sometimes I check on people see if they're still alive and uh, she was still alive the week before but then I get a, a message on, on Facebook that she had gotten into a car with some drunk drivers and they and the car had flipped over. She was thrown from the car and the car crushed her. She was dead instantly. There was no scooting the car off of her. There was no broken bones. To be, I'm, I mean, there might have been, but I'm saying there was no healing from the broken bones. That was it. I shared my faith with her. I tried. But like I said, you can't win them all. So, my challenge to you is to don't miss an opportunity. Don't miss an opportunity to share your faith with someone that you just met. Because you never know. 
take a walk through the cemetery and tell me how many old people you see in that cemetery. Not very many. There's more young people than there are old people. You can do the numbers. Go through there and add them up and all you get is a little dash in between. Doesn't tell your story, does it? Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. We thank you so much for your, your presence tonight. I believe that you have laid this on my heart and I believe that I have tried to deliver it the best of my abilities. Lord, I, I, I pray that this resonates in our hearts tonight. That we don't miss an opportunity to share your, your goodness, your love, your terrifying, terrifying wrath against the ones that, we, that are our enemies. That's good news, God. Some people don't see it like that, but if you're for me, then who can be against me? If, if you're the God that you say you are, who can be against me? Lord, I don't... I don't care about people's opinions about me. I don't care if they think I'm a religious fanatic or whatever they want to call me. Lord, help me be that light. Help me turn on the, my light in this dark, dark world. Help me become that person that loves you so much that we, I'll put aside all my, my vainness my, I don't want to offend them. Lord, help me get over that. Help me be a, a better witness to people. Help us be a better witness to people. Help us be, be the church that gets out and loves people and that, that tries to lead people to Christ, that tells the good news. You know, God sent His Son, and, and His Son died just for you. And He loves you. And He wants a relationship with you. He craves that relationship. But if you don't want it, He's not going to force you. That's what free will is. That's what love is. It, love, it, love cannot be forced. It has to be free. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for everything that you've done and everything that you are doing in our lives, even though it seems so dark right now. Thank you. Be with us as we leave this place. Help us in the mission field to grow your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.